Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions – Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love Group and is part of the Education and Love series. In the How I Feel About Love presentation, Jesus introduces five basic questions to ask ourselves, examines why we lie to ourselves, and details a series of truths about God and love that we must be willing to face if we are ever going to learn about and grow in love. Recorded on the 5th of March 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Yeah, that song was called Eagle's Hole in the World. For those of you want to know what that was. Isn't that true, huh? Sort of some bad problems in the world and they seem to keep going on for millennia <laughs> which is an indication that we're not very good learners isn't it okay well let's uh, examine why that's the case why we're not very good learners <laughs> and a lot of it's got to do with how we feel about love and how we feel about change there are two two big areas that we need to analyze so the rest of our day we'll be examining firstly this point about how we actually feel about love inside of ourselves and then the second uh, part of the day after the longer break we'll be looking at how we feel about change inside of ourselves in particular and even external change but we're looking at it from how we personally feel and be honest about how we feel now the first thing we'd like to talk about here is is the need for personal honesty now as we've already pointed out for the majority of you your worth is attached to what you currently know right? and what I'm trying to do is to change what you know <laughs> now to you that means that I'm trying to reduce your worth and that's a problem uh, we need to address this particular problem now now that requires a lot of humility doesn't it we need to be able to feel what we feel without thinking that our worth is being attacked by now our knowledge being criticized so I'm going to cri be critical of the knowledge that you currently have that's not uh, the, the goal of that is not to to criticize or pull down your worth I know your worth as much as any other person including myself in God's eyes so you're worth the same and and you're also worth the same as any little child who knows nothing so that tells me that you don't have to know anything to be worth something in God's eyes and it's only this belief we have that our worth is associated with knowledge that we that we need to address so so we need to first deconstruct that which is what we believe is true and we need to make it that which what God knows is true and that sign meaning not equal <laughs> right not equal to what we know so our worth isn't equal to what we know so this will make it and, and obviously if we believe our worth is connected to what we know there's an emotion there that we need to address and that's going to need to be addressed at some point if you're ever going to receive a higher education in love you're going to have to address this linkage that we've made between worth and knowledge the other thing we're going to have to address is our desire to maintain an arrogant position which is often very much linked to this concept of worth so in other words we resist new information because because the new information contradicts the old information and also contradicts the emotional state we have inside of ourselves about the linkage we have between what we know about the old information and what we believe to be right or true so we need to break down that as well we need to break down this arrogance so there's some questions that I'd like you to ask yourself I'm going to, I'm going to read them out to you five questions am I going to let go of my own arrogance question number one am I question number two am I going to be prepared to let go of my definitions of love or am I going to keep holding on to them like for grim death really because that's where it's headed <laughs> Are we going to hold on to them or are we going to let them go? Three, 
Am I truly prepared to emotionally feel my own lack of love? In other words, to have to go through the process. See, see, the reason why we believe things is usually because of emotions within us and those emotions must be released in order for your belief system to change. And many of you are deeply resisting this process of emotional release of false beliefs. And it has to happen if, if, because, it, because there's an issue of preclusion in your soul. If, if this false belief keeps a hold of your soul, then no true belief can enter it. So you need, you're going to need to go through voluntarily by your own, in your own life, through your own process, through no one else telling you to do it, you're going to have to desire it for yourself in order to make a change. And if you don't do it, I'm saying to you that no, change will, no real change will be possible. Right? Number four, do I really want to absorb God's definition of love no matter what the seeming cost of doing so is? Now, at the moment, many of you believe the costs of receiving God's definition of love are so negative and great that you don't want to do it. And I, I'm saying to you, well, that's because of your definition of love. You see, if you had a different definition of love, you'd actually see absorbing God's definition of love as positive and fantastic. You'd have a completely different outlook, right? But, but of course, the world is going to be in disharmony with you if you do this. And, and as you know, the world, when it's in disharmony with you as an individual, means that your life, and it could potentially mean that your life, becomes threatened as a result. And this is one of the main reasons why you don't want to change your definition between the world's and yours. Because you know that you could potentially be threatened and therefore have potentially bad things happen in your life that you didn't want to have happen just because you have a different definition than the world has. So this is a question I have to ask myself. Do I really want to absorb God's definition of love no matter what? Or do I want to absorb God's definition of love as long as it's easy? That's more like it, eh? That's for most of us, that's how we feel. As long as it's easy, I'll do that. And, and most of us even have this concept that it should be easy. Now, I can't see the logic of that either, because the world's definition of love is pretty firmly entrenched. So anybody that's in disharmony to the world's definition of love surely is going to have some issues with the world itself. Is that not the case? And this is what I meant in the first century when I said you need to be in the world but not of the world. Because if you're, if you're of the world when you're in the world, then you're doing exactly the same thing as the world's doing. And I see that as a major problem for us. Because if we keep doing what the world accepts as okay, that means that the world is in agreement with me. Therefore, I've got no chance of change. No chance of growth, no chance of being educated in love if the world's in agreement with me. Many of you see being in harmony with the world as a good thing. Oh, I see it as a terrible thing. So you can see our own perspectives need to change there if we're going to get God's definition of love. I'm not saying the world is you know, in a terrible place on every subject, because there are some, very few, subjects where the world is in the process of learning, which is great. But on the majority of issues when it comes to love, and particularly when it comes to the attitude to truth and love, the world is in complete disharmony, in, on complete opposite sides as what God is. Now, under those circumstances, if you absorb God's definition of love, can you see what potentially will happen there's a potential risk to your very life doing so as a result of what the world may do as a result. And are you prepared for that? Or are you just going to go, no, that makes my life too hard. I'm not going to do it now. All right. what are you, what's going to be your choice? That's the question I'm asking. Felix, you want to ask? If you come down. Oh, good day, Felix. Um, can you give, me, give us an example of, of that, where you just said an example that would be for like most people here? Like, um, oh, I can give every, you every, many, but on. let's start with a few that you would relate to from your past oh, e education. You. And that is that many of you believe that feeding another person's addiction is an act of love towards them. Many of you believe that. 
Many of you also believe that if you don't feed, an addi if your addiction, your own addiction is not fed, then it justifies anger and potential violence towards another person on your part. Many of you believe that. Both of those things are completely untrue from God's perspective. In fact, from God's perspective, feeding the addiction of another person is a sin. Out of harmony with love. Right? And feeding your own addiction, from God's perspective, is also a sin. Out of harmony with love. So there's an exam two examples of how our own, our own definition of love, completely the opposite of God's. Hmm. Um, but you said risk to our very, very life. Like, I can understand for yourself because, um, you know, you're very challenging to the world, obviously, like you were in the first century. But like myself... As, as you will be once you're in harmony with God. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. You understand? Okay. Cause you, you believe at the moment that's a mark of my personality. Yeah. Uh, so and it's yeah. not... <laughs> uh, yeah. okay. it's not it's, a, it's something that I've learned to do it's not a part of my personality or nature to always have to confront people <laughs> do you understand <laughs> yeah, I would, okay. I would, you know, in the spirit world yeah. in the celestial heavens we have lovely time <laughs> and because nobody, nobody goes through all these terrible confront, confrontation type emotions yeah. so, so I've had thousands of years of not having to confront people isn't that wonderful I see. Right? <laughs> but here on earth why, why am I like this? Because I have to be. To be in harmony with God, I'm going to be in disharmony with the world. Okay. I'm going to be. And that's unavoidable. And many of you believe what is a part of my personality. That you can just go, you can dismiss that. And what I'm trying to do is demonstrate to you, actually, it's not going to be a part of, it's not a part of my personality. It's a part of the requirement that love and the desire for love and truth places upon me. Do you think I want to be in disharmony with most of the people around me all the time? Of course I don't. But if it means that I have to, have to give up God's definition of love, then I will be in disharmony with everybody if that's what's required. And at some point that's going to be required of you. Of course you won't be in disharmony with everybody because you'll get to firstly agree with God, who by the way is the most powerful being in the universe, so that's always a good thing. You, you, you would also be in harmony, complete harmony with all of God's laws, so isn't that fantastic? Now instead of working against God's laws, you're working with them. And you'll also be in harmony with me. So you'll always have a, <laughs> you'll always have a friend. <laughs> you'll always have a friend. But, but there might not be too many other people you're in harmony with, unfortunately. Yeah. But these are the questions we need to ask ourselves. If we're unwilling to resolve those basic questions, then there's really little point in being here, to be, to be frank with you. Because, it, because resolving those particular questions is going to require a change, isn't it, in you? And, and this is all your choice. You're not getting forced to do this from anybody. God, in fact, is not forcing you to do it. God's laws, of course, are trying to bring you to that point. But God himself is not forcing you. God's still going to love you no matter what you do. Of course, you won't feel that love no matter what you do because a lot of what you do will remove you from that love through your own actions and through what happens to your heart as a result of choosing to do these things. But, but that's your choice. You've got will. Isn't that wonderful? You have will. You can choose. You can choose to do what you want. What I'm suggesting to you, if you keep choosing the same thing that you've, already cho that you've previously chosen, then you're going to keep getting the same results as you've already got. And I'm suggesting to you that maybe, you know, if we look at the world over thousands of years now, this is what's been happening. Same choices, same results, same choices, same results. In this last century alone, there's been two world wars and almost a third one right which could have been disastrous if it actually happened because it would have been a push button nuclear one right in in 100 years and if that's not enough to teach us that we're doing something wrong then what is going to we see like 50 million children dying every year of abortion and another 50 million children starved to death every year on this planet so like we're worried about some maniac attacking some towers or whatever or some maniac doing a bomb in the subway or whatever we're worried about all that where only 200 people die and yet we completely overlook the fact that 100 million children die children die every year from our actions <laughs> like how blind are we 
right? Now, if, if you keep doing things the same way, you're going to get the same results. We can't overlook these things. We can't. And you can't overlook what's causing them inside of oneself. We can't. If we're ever going to grow in love, we can't. We've got to stop being blind. I said to the Apostle John, which was actually finished up being recorded in the book of Revelation, I said, these people need eye salve to rub in their eyes so that they can see. <laughs> right, that's what they need. And we need that. We need, we need something to open our eyes so that we can actually see what we're doing. Because we're, we're happy to grieve and be afraid of some maniac you know, blowing himself up somewhere. We're, we're willing to do that without looking at the causes of it even. We're willing to be afraid of that while at the same time not be totally freaked out that we're willing to see 100 million children die every year. <laughs> That's how bad it is. Uh, most of us don't even give it a second thought, to be honest. We don't. And certainly we don't take actions to reverse it. We're too worried about the 50 million children that are aborted every year. We're too worried about confronting the woman's right to choose. And most of you are terrified of that, right? And then the other 50 million, we're too worried about what governments or, or religions or other people will think about us doing something about it, right? We, Yet yeah, we all have the capacity to act. So, so this is what we need to learn first. We need to understand that these are choices that we're making. So I'll leave you with that question. What I want to do now is focus your attention on why, how, what we actually feel about love. And what I want to do is engage you in this process. So we're going to have the, the mics here and uh, engage you in the process of telling me what you really feel about love, like honestly. What, what's your honest feelings about love? And I'm going to break the feelings you tell me into a number of different categories. So fire away. Jennifer, if you come down. Thanks, Scott. Love for me is doing things that I feel I'll get approval from and people will like me. All right, so love for you is doing things for approval? Yeah, yes. And also, therefore, getting approval Yes. as well. Not rocking the boat. For the things done. Yes. Yeah. So when you do so something for someone to get approval and then they don't give you approval, how does that feel? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's good. If we come to Ivana straight in front and then across to Dennis and then we'll work our way back. Um, is that on? Oh, yeah. Um, so I view love <coughs> as taking away someone else's hurt and also people taking away my hurt. Yep, taking away hurt, we put in there. Good. Dennis? Uh, fickle. Fickle, yeah, good word, Dennis. So um, I'm just going to change my... That one's, that one's to be... That one's to be... Can I throw that up the back there? Because that needs to go into the <laughs> rubbish bin up there. And I'll just uh, grab another one. All right, fickle, yeah, good word. Very good word. Fickle is changeable. You know, one day it's like this, next day it's like that. Human love is very much like that, isn't it? One day somebody tells you they love you, the next day they hate you. <laughs> you know, what's, what's happened, you know? And you might not have hardly done anything or say, even said anything. You don't know what's in your ass or your elbow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like what's going on? If you go straight back behind you, Teresa. It, it hurts. Love hurts, yep. And punishing. And? Punishing. Punishing, yep. Okay, good. Now if we go to Paul, and then on this side, if we come down to the mic, right down the front to Ben, and then we work our way back there too. When someone wants to really know me and accept me. So you feel that uh, love is when somebody accepts you? Yep. And desires to know you? Yep. Yep. Ben? Uh, I feel it's very fleeting. Sorry? Fleeting. Fleeting, yes. yeah, good word. It comes over, it's very similar to fickle in a way, isn't it? Fleeting. Yep. Disappear at the drop of a hat. Yep, so we go back to Christiana. Oh, so sorry. Were you, 
You went next where you, Claudia. No. Sac- if we just hand the mic back to the people who've got their hands sure. up. Uh, sacrificial. Sacrificial, yes. It's a sacrifice. Yeah, a lot of you feel that, right? Somebody sacrifices for you. Oh, they just love you so nice. It's so lovely. Felix. Oh, sorry, Talia. Yep. Um, it's completely unreliable and it's about taking. So it's unreliable, yes. I suppose that fits in with fi- fickle. Yeah. And, and taking, oh, cool. we've got taking her away, but also you, you're really saying taking from a, like, uh, demanding. Yeah. Yeah. Selfish yeah, so demanding. Let's write demands. Demanding. Yep. Uh, Felix, um, I feel uh, that if I, if I love, um, the results will be bad and more painful. So, so, uh, so, not, not the around, so it exposes you to potential hurt. No, more like I'll, I'll be loving, but then I'll just be attacked for it. And, right. Um, and or if I'm giving up an addiction, then actually this is something. Uh, you, you know, no story speaks for. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, that if I give up my addiction, it'll be really, really hard, and that'll be really painful, rather yeah. than. The other way around. Yep. So yep. Well, let's put it in the painful bracket, shall we? I've realised that keeping the addiction actually gets just gets worse and worse and worse. So. <laughs> yeah, we haven't quite realised that yet. Otherwise, <laughs> you would have given them up. Who are we up to on this side? Um, where, where's the mic? Oh, right up the back. Sorry. Love requires honesty. So you feel it, it requires honesty. Do you really feel that though? Because what what I find most of you do is you lie all the time. You lie about how you feel, you lie about what you think, you, you falsify to even your closest companions how you feel. You falsify even to your partners, the, you know, a whole heap of things. They ask you something, you say something because you think they're going to attack you if you say something else. So I don't know if most of you believe that. I think most of you believe completely opposite of that, that love requires you know, a little white lie here and there, really. Um. Love's conditional. You it's conditional, be, yeah. You a, lot of, a lot of you feel that. You need to be worthy before somebody will love you. Yes, a uh, very important point. Yep, many of you believe that. Straighter, yep. Um, I expect people to fill up my love bucket. So you've got a love bucket. So I'm empty. I'm on empty without love and I go to someone else. To so, so, so it's sort of like needy. Needy, yeah. Shall we say. <laughs> Yeah, I need you like the flower needs the rain. You know I need you. You know that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, who are we up to this side? Um, yep, Nada. If oh, sorry, we're at Cody. So let's yeah. fire away with whoever has the mic. <laughs> um, un- I feel it's unreachable. Um, in terms of like, um, it's a, it's an idealistic, unreachable, idealistic. No, I feel like whatever I do, I I can't. I'm never going to be loved. Okay, so that's about earning love, isn't it? Yeah. So you, yeah. you feel really that love is earned. Yeah. You have to earn earn love. Yeah. Harder. Um, I feel like love will open me up to victimisation, that I'll become a victim. So risky, shall we say? Risky. Yep. Uh, I feel I can't trust love. Yeah, yeah, so untrustworthy. Yep. Okay. Who are we up to now? Uh, If you um, love, it makes you weak. Ah, yes. Very good one for many of you. You do believe that love makes you weak. It's a weakness. Yeah. On this side, who are we up to? Far away. Uh, Uh, Make sure your mic's up. uh, uh, And also, can Corny see you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like a fairy tale, unrealistic. All right, yeah, fairy tale is a good one, isn't it? Many of us believe that. Yep. Good. Uh, if we go, where are we? Up? Who's got the mic next? Yep, just fire away. Unconditional love is judged as weakness. Yes, so that's in the weak category. Um, so who are we up to this side? Fire away. I'm excluded from the possibility. Sorry, you say that again? I'm excluded from the possibility... So it's only for other people? Mm. It's only for others, not for me. Yeah. I thought love was only true in fairy tales, meant for someone else and not for me. 
Love is out to get me. <laughs> Sandra. Uh, it means to me that I get all of my addictions met unconditionally. Okay. okay, so people have to do what I want. Yeah, isn't that demanding, really? It's just, okay, well, you've got the picture. That's what we feel about love. Okay, and, and I agree, the majority of you have those feelings about love, right? And, and what does that tell us? No, microphones, please. Um, Natalie, thank you. Well, I feel I have all of those and it makes me afraid to love. Mm. To even want it or no, like... Yeah, see, see, you were all thinking that these are true. Right? And then that makes you afraid. Well, of course you're going to be afraid if you believe that's true. So, see, see, this is one thing I feel the majority of you don't understand about fear. Is fear is caused by false expectations appearing real. Fear is caused by false beliefs. And what I see you guys doing over and over and over and over again is continuing to feed yourself on false beliefs. And then, of course, you say, I'm afraid. Well, of course you're afraid. Because the more you feed yourself on false beliefs, the more afraid you're going to get. There's no, there's no, there's no way that that can change. So, so what I see is, yes, you do have these beliefs about love, right? The real question we've got to ask is where did they all come from and how do I get rid of them? But we'll talk about that in a minute. But you can see we've got all of these beliefs about love. And then we say, but I'm terrified now to be loved. Well, no wonder you are because you have all those beliefs about love. If you didn't have any of those beliefs about love, you probably wouldn't be terrified about real love. It's because of these beliefs you have that you're terrified. And you don't see it that way. You, you don't see the problem as being within yourself, having these beliefs within oneself. You see the problem as that's the world's view. This is a, certainly the world's view of love, I agree. It is the world's view of love. Therefore, it's become how I feel about love. But the reality is it's not God's view of love. right? But you don't know that at this point, right? Because we've yet to examine how you feel about God, which we'll do in a second. Yeah, Natalie? But often, you like I've experienced hurt by someone who says that they love me, and so my experiences. But, like yes, but, but stop for a sec. Just because someone says they love you, it doesn't mean they do. To me, that's a. F Why do you want to believe things that you get told? It's because you want to believe them. How about how do they treat you? If they treat you badly, they didn't love you, right? That's how you work. How, so, so, so just because somebody says, I love you, it doesn't, it doesn't mean a thing. Unless their actions mirror or harm, uh, are in harmony with their words, then it means something. Yep. So, so what I see the majority of you doing is accepting the words. And then when the words turn out to be all of their beliefs imposed on love on your relationship you then go love's very painful love hurts it's all risky you can't do it whatever and now you're afraid to love and you're afraid to be loved the majority of you are terrified about even just being loved because you you think it means that you're going to have to sacrifice there'll be demands on you it's going to be really hard you, you know there's going to be this needy projection at you and you're going to have to fulfill what they want you're going to have to do what they want and so forth does that make sense that's how you feel but I need to stop the discussion about this subject now and move on to an even more important subject. So that's how we feel about love. Bit sad, right? But it is how the world generally feels about love. You hear it in all the songs, don't you? All the songs about all the so-called love songs. <laughs> Not very much love in the love songs, unfortunately. Okay. All right, so there's how we feel about love. And we need to be honest about that. So I'm not saying don't be honest about it. I'm saying be honest about it. This is how you feel about love. And we need to at least be honest about that. But we need to even be more honest about the next thing that I'm going to raise with you. 
and you'll see why in a minute. I'll just rub these out. So my next question is this. How do you really feel about God? Now, for many of you, you couldn't even hear the word God when I first started talking to you. <laughs> Without having a big spit, you know, like, <laughs> you couldn't even hear the word. So that tells me there's a lot of anger and rage, so I'll put that up first, shall we? <laughs> anger with God, angry with God. Rage. So, uh, what, but what do you feel about... I'm, I don't want to focus you on your feelings about God. Uh, so I want you to focus on what you believe God to be. So I want you to tell me what you believe God to be. Really, what you believe God to be. So if we start coming down with Carol, on this side, if we start right up the back with Dave, and then work our way forward. Unattainable. Okay, so yep, God's unattainable. Unapproachable and unattainable? Unapproachable. Um, inside the castle and I'm locked out. Yep. Unapproachable. Yep. Uh, Tara? Oh, sorry. Whoever has a mic. Yep. Unfathomable. Sorry? Unf unfathomable. <laughs> That's Just a fairly long word, but I'll unfathom. Yep. Uh, Dave? Like uh, a harsh judge who's sitting up high on a, a big stone throne sort of thing? Hard and harsh. Yes. Has it. If we pass it to the Dave in front of you. Choosy and selective. Right, choosy, yep, yeah, selective. And who are we over here? He's got I was going to say the that, same. Yep. Yeah. Who are we over here? Who's got it? Yep, far away. Um, I feel that he's not a, not as good as looking after me as I myself am. Right, so he's a, a poor, shall we say, a poor parent? Yes. Yep. Poor carer. Yep, no worries. Yep, okay. Who's next down there? Who's got it? Yep. Um, he doesn't listen to me. So, yeah, so he doesn't listen. Uh, who's next on this side? Uh, God is punishing to me. Punishing, yeah. Yep. Who's on this side? Yep, whoever's got the mic, just yell it out. Patient. Patient, so you think God's patient? I don't know if I'd agree with that. I'm not very good. <laughs> well, I, I don't believe there. you believe that. And the reason why I don't believe you believe it is because you're very afraid of making mistakes. And a person who's patient allows you to make mistakes. And yet you're very afraid of making mistakes. So you're afraid of getting punished from a person making mistakes. So that tells me that you don't really believe God's patient. You, in fact, you believe God expects you to do exactly what God wants, and if you don't, then you're in trouble. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's what I would feel from you, from you if we go across to... That God allows many terrible things to happen in this world. Yeah, so what would you say? Uh, cruel? Cruel. And uh, what's another word uh, for allowing things to happen that are bad? Uncaring, it's even worse than that, isn't it? If God, if you had the power to change it and you don't change it, yeah. it's almost like cruel and vindictive, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Little little chap believes agrees with us there. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next over here? So, I'm just like too quiet. Not not obvious. Not yeah. noisy enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really, what we're saying is is that I can't hear him. He doesn't talk loud enough to me. <laughs> you know. So maybe what we really want is for God to do a bit of yelling at us or something. Uh, we, we need to, we can't, cannot hear God, so 
we're basically saying that God's aren't we basically saying that God's dumb in the sense of deaf and dumb so we probably also think that God's deaf as well don't we God's deaf and dumb <laughs> can't speak and can't hear us at the same time yeah who's over this side where's the mic uh, yep, yep. Yellow. Um, I feel he's really attainab unattainable, but yeah. very creative. So you feel God's creative? Just seeing the butterflies and parrots and, and the laws of action, laws of attraction happening. Yeah, well, well, why is it though that all of you are so afraid of destruction then? If, if, God, if you really believe God's creative, you wouldn't be so afraid of getting destroyed. You wouldn't be so afraid of death, would you? If you believe God's creative, so I don't know. To me, it feels like it feels to me like you actually believe God's destructive. All right? Who's over this side? Who's got mic? Um, like superior to me. Yep, has superior. Um, unimportant and irrelevant. No, that's you. How he feels about you? Or what about him? You're saying God's unimportant? I feel, yep, God's unimportant, like um, out of the picture. Yep, so you're basically saying um, there's some words for that, isn't there, that are common words, so can we think of them? If, God, if God's irrelevant and unimportant, what are we really saying? Inferior, small. Oh. You're really, aren't we really saying God's dead? Like, <laughs> like there's no such thing as God? So, so let's put it, uh, we don't even believe God exists, so we don't, so God does not exist. Uh, that's, a, that's a belief that many of us actually have, isn't it? Or if he does exist, he has no power. Weak. God's weak, has no power. Oh. Um, that God is a dark, mysterious monster that I need to placate, just so he'll be benevolent to me. Yeah, the dark... Mysterious, Mysterious monster <laughs> that I need to placate. Monster <laughs> who is basically narcissistic. <laughs> Narcissist. And uh, I need to earn his benevolence. I need to get on his good side so he'll be benevolent to me. Yeah, that's right. That's like, you know, so someone who you're going to be terrified of because <laughs> of his terrible power, yes. Yeah, I, I agree. Most of you have these kind of emotions, yes? Okay. Uh, let's stop there for a moment and just point out a fact. This is what you feel about the source of education in love. Do you think that you're going to want to hear from him? I doubt it. This is our problem. We don't want to hear from that character, do we? Because that, to me, seems a pretty bad character. Would you, if you met that character on the street, would you go, ah, oh, and say, happy to see you? <laughs> You'd probably be looking down, is he coming, is he coming? Let's go the other way, right? Uh, you, meet, you meet that kind of character, you want to run from them, do you not? This is what many of you are doing. You're running away from God constantly. So the very source of education in love, who's got the potential to give you the truth about love, you are actually running away from. Right? You're actually avoiding him. Felix, if we have the mic. Uh, I feel a bit confused. Um, like I, I f uh, feel I have some, sometimes I have some longing for God and I feel God is loving, but then I engage some addictions and then everything, that kind of just seems to disappear. And so... Yeah, many of you have try, have, are trying this, what I would classify as an addictive way of trying to connect to God. Okay. You, 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 and we'll talk in a minute about why. Because yeah, let's take this discussion a bit further, shall we? Basically... We can see from these words that we're using in our definition of God that we don't think very much of God's character and God's nature. Can you see that? And can you see that for the majority of us, when we talk about God, and this is exactly how we feel about that being, so, so we have no desire 
to connect to that being. No real heartfelt desire to connect because this is what we believe God is. Right? Can you see that is a problem if God is the source of love and God is the source of all of your education in the future? Can you see that, th that believing this about God is a, is a bit of a problem? Right? But let's take this analysis one step further. Most of you have never had an interaction with God. Never. In your whole life. So why do you believe these things if you've never had actually had an interaction with God? It's a good question, isn't it? What do you think if we come down? Um, I feel that we believe these things written up on the board because they're an interpretation of our parents um, and what we feel about our parents because they were our first source of reaching out to love and they rejected us. Um. Spot on. Spot on. We've put all that and that's how our parents have actually treated us. Or to put it more more completely, because it might not just be parents, it's our, it, it's our childhood, or we could also say, we could say it's the family of origin, you know, where it's how they've treated us. And it's also how our sc school training has treated us, isn't it? Now, can you see what we're doing here? It's quite, it's quite sneaky on our part. It's quite sneaky, and this is a problem that many of you have. You're being quite sneaky. What you're doing is you've had these people, these groups of people, treat you a certain way. And instead of actually looking at how they've treated you, you have blamed it all on God, who hasn't treated you that way. And do you know why you do it? So that you can avoid having to deal with the fact that these people have treated you that way. That's why you do it. It's a choice you're making. It's a will-based choice to avoid the truth. Now, if I asked you how you felt about your parents, many of you would have had kind things to say about your parents. And in fact, many of you would have said completely almost the opposite to that about your parents. And it's interesting, your parents are the people you've had an interaction with, but you haven't had one with God, and yet you're prepared to blame God as having this character, and at the same time prepared to not face the truth about the true character of the people who did treat you this way. Now that should be a big light bulb moment for you. Because if it isn't, there's very little chance you have of learning about love from now on, unless it is. You follow? Because cause your parents are in the world's condition of love. They can't teach you anything more than what they've learned about love themselves. They are not a higher source of love than you are. Because they're not a higher source of love than you are, you maintaining these beliefs about them where you, that you can actually learn from them and f feel from them is Im it's impossible. And yet what you do is you, you, have, you have used this very, what I would feel is a very manipulative and subversive technique to help you avoid a whole large amount of painful emotion. So what you do is you say, it's not my parents that have got these problems, it's not my family of origin that's got these problems, it's actually God that's got all of these problems. And I'm going to refuse to connect to God because it's God that's got these problems. And that's what I see the majority of you continuing to do. You're avoiding the truth about your family of origin and projecting all of the unfelt emotion from your childhood on God, as if God's to blame for your childhood. 
And yet the majority of you have never had a single interaction with God to know whether God's character is like this or not. Right? So I feel that's quite unfair what you're doing. <laughs> Can you see that? If, if, somebody, if somebody said this is how they think about you and they'd never had an interaction with you, never met you, never got to know you, do you would you feel that's quite unfair? If they projected all that at you? Of course you would, right? And that's what we're doing with God. And we do it for a reason. And the reason is to avoid how we f actually feel about the people who did do these things to us. That's why we do it. If we come down to Karen down in front. To me, it seems like um, if somebody's bullying you, then you turn around and bully somebody who's not going to hit back, and God's not going to hit back. So that's exactly so. right. That's one of the reasons why we do it with God, because we we have an inbuilt concept that either God's dead anyway, <laughs> or it's a great person to put all of our woes and all of our tribulation and everything else upon, so that we can avoid having to feel about the actual people who did it to us, and avoid having to confront what they've done. Emotionally, internally, inside of ourselves, confronting what has happened. David? <coughs> Is it all so kind of like, particularly when we're really small, that we're really open and we're really trusting and that trust has been severely betrayed? Yes, that's exactly my next point. I'm going to talk to you about this. You imagine when you're little and Daddy comes home and he's, well, Daddy leaves for work in the morning but he says to you before he goes, I'm going to come home and play with you tonight. Right? So what is the child feeling? At this stage, the child is feeling hope, what I would classify as hope. They're looking forward and feeling excited about the potential of Daddy coming home and playing tonight, you know, throwing some ball or whatever with them tonight. Daddy doesn't rock up. Now what do they feel? Well, they feel that, that firstly, there's a lot of things, isn't there? There's... I can't really trust that what Daddy says is true. I can't really have faith in any of Daddy's future promises because he's already proven that he hasn't followed through with the past promises. So I can't trust in his future promises either. And I have to now be very careful about trusting anybody, even the people who say they love me. Right? I have to be very careful about trusting them trusting what they will do based on what they've said. So can you see straight, just what one event causes an injury in the viewpoint of love, causes an injury in the viewpoint of trust, causes an injury in the viewpoint of faith. And because we're desperate for daddy's attention, usually as a child, we then no longer blame daddy for all of that and we have to put the blame somewhere else. And yet we could coast quite easily process that emotionally just by feeling the disappointment we have in Daddy. Feeling that we were lied to or feeling that we can't trust anymore as a result and so forth. We just need to process those as feelings, right? But, but we choose to not do that. We choose to hold on to those feelings. We choose to suppress them. We choose to keep them under control. And as a result, now the next person who makes a promise to us we automatically are not trusting them. Right. And that person who makes a promise to us and fulfills them, you know we still won't trust them? We still won't trust them. And they can make ten promises and fulfill every promise and you know we still won't trust them. And you know why? Because we've not released the very first event, the very first thing that happened. So you can see that what we're doing is blaming God and then of course we're, not, we're, we're disconnecting from God because we feel God is this character that is not very lovable, right? Or And certainly not someone, like if someone was like that, I, I don't think I'd want to have them in my life either. Do you know what I mean? And in fact, someone just have to be one of those things and I probably wouldn't want them in my life let alone all of those things. 
right? And yet, what I observe you doing is you still want your mummy and daddy in your life. You still want the people who've done this to you in your life, and, and yet you reject the person who's never treated you this way. Do you see? Isn't that ironic, what we do? Just because we don't want to address the reality of our childhood situation. So when it gets down to how we feel about love, which is the question we've been asking you, and I've just got to keep hold of my time here. Yes, now I've got seven minutes to go. Um, when we ask you this question, how we feel about love, we're focusing you on, firstly, how you feel about love, and secondly, how you feel about God. And you can see that how we feel about love is also very much about how we were treated from our family of origin. And we can see that how we feel about God is almost identical. It's again how we were treated by our family of origin. And the thing I want to remind you is this. Because the majority of you have not had a personal connection with God at this stage, and I'm not saying that's a necessary, like, um, I'm not criticising that, I'm just saying it's a statement of truth. Because the majority of you have not yet had this personal connection with God at this stage, you need to understand that the reason why is because there's a whole lot of belief systems that are being projected at the very person who can love you, and in fact who can love you better than anyone else can. Right? And there's all these feelings inside of ourselves that are preventing the relationship. You see, from God's perspective, God's doing everything God possibly can to have a relationship with you. Everything. And the majority of you have been thinking that it's because of God's problem. There's something that, God, that you don't understand about God that's causing you to not have a relationship with God. And that's not true. It's something you don't understand about you that's causing you to not have a relationship with God. You see? Can you think about that for a moment? I see a lot of people blaming God for not having a relationship with God. And yet the real problem is not understanding yourself and where these feelings of blame towards God come from. And they actually have nothing to do with God because you've not had the personal relationship with God yet. And, and in fact, for the majority of you, you were prevented from having a personal relationship with God right from the time you were conceived. Because these emotions, these beliefs, were already in the very person you incarnated into, you could say. The emotions were imposed from your mothers right at the time of conception. And your mother has this belief. And her mother had that belief. And her father had that belief. And her mother and father had that belief. The successive generations of people have all had these kind of beliefs. For centuries, for millennia. And so there's all this stuff in, going on inside of us that we need to understand is going on inside of us that prevents our relationship with God. We're, we're like going, no, 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 I do not want you. I do not want this relationship with you because this is how I think about you. And it's not just how you think about them. It's actually, the sad thing is, it's actually how you think about them. That's the sad thing, isn't it? So if we come down to Felix, thanks. I'm not sure if this question belongs in here or the Q&A session. Mm. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong. Just ask it and I'll okay. tell you. Um, I'm a little confused because I, I... Oh, what's the question? Um, I feel... Uh, oh, sorry, I... No, That's all right. Sorry. That's all right. Let's go across. Um, so just if I can recap on what you've just said, mm -hmm. plain and simply, if we release all our emotions towards... The way we feel about mum and dad, like all the negative ones. And what happened to us at school and so forth. Yeah. Yep. Um, well, um, we automatically kind of get God in our life. 
No. No, damn it. But you will no longer be automatically predisposed to not having God in your life. What do you mean by that? You'll no longer think that God's these things. Okay. So, we'll so have then you be able a... to, it's a lot easier to make a choice. <laughs> so just imagine for a moment, like, there's, there, that's one side. This is how you believe about God. And then just imagine because you've released certain emotions, this is how you think about God after that. Let me show you. This is how you think about God. So it's like a clean slate. We'll have a clean slate about God and, you know, <laughs> kind of... So, so now what, what would, would, would be your desire, do you think? You, you'd would want to find out more, wouldn't you? <laughs> get to know it. Get, get to know a bit better. Get yeah, find it. out, you know, what is in this slate, if you like. What, what's there? What's re re in re reality there, wouldn't you? Can you see if you didn't have all that, you, you'd probably be more disposed to discovering what God really is. But at the moment, because we've got all of that, we're not very disposed to discovering that, are we? We're, we're in a state of prevention. We're in a state of resistance to discovering the truth about God. Does that make sense? Cardi, thanks. Um, so, AJ, is... Oh, gosh. Is it possible or is it not possible um, to get... To, to, love, to feel God or to love God before you um, em erase all the false beliefs? Or do you have to do all the false beliefs before you can connect at all? Well, no. What you've got to do is change who you're associating it with. See, this okay. is what the majority of you are not doing. See, see, you're associating all of those beliefs. You're purposefully, this is the point I'm trying to make to you, you're purposefully associating all of these false beliefs about God to God. Because it helps you avoid associating them with the real problem, the real people who cause these beliefs. That's why you do it. Because it helps you avoid a whole series of pains and a whole series of suffering. It also helps you even continue having a relationship with the very people who have harmed you by ignoring how they've harmed you. You follow? Yes. That's what we're doing. We're ignoring how they've harmed us and then desire a relationship with them still. That's what we do. And yet God hasn't harmed us and yet we're avoiding that relationship because we've imposed it all. So what really needs to happen, Cardi, for you to begin a relationship with God is very simple when you think about it. You've got to stop thinking these things are true about God because you want to and start thinking that you are in this condition with God. You don't know anything about him. That's what you've got to do. Get to that stage. Now, that doesn't require processing all these emotions, does it? No. It requires the disassociation between these emotions and God. Just like you have an association between worth and the current error that's inside of you, the false beliefs, and you think they're true, you also have inside of you an association of these beliefs with God. And that's what you need to deconstruct. You need to get to see that actually you have not. You need to face the truth. You have not had a relationship with God at this point. You do not know anything about God. So stop thinking you do, right? which is how the world wants you to think, and start thinking and understanding the truth, which is this. Once you make that disassociation, you'll be willing to process these emotions which will greatly help you in your life, but those emotions will be projected at the very people, or they'll be felt about, the very people that caused them, not God. You follow? Thank you. Yep. And this is what I feel many, like most of you, all of, all of you are doing this. You, you're projecting at God a whole heap of things because it helps you avoid the truth that firstly you know really nothing about God but secondly and more importantly it helps you avoid the truth that this, these emotions you do not want to feel from your family of origin. You, do, you want to make out it never happened because if you make out it never happened, what happens? You get to not feel about what happened because you don't believe it happened. 
You, you know why Alzheimer's is one of the fastest growing old age sicknesses on the planet? Because the majority of us do not want to remember what happened. The majority of us don't. Right? If we, if we chose to remember, we would not have that problem. But we choose to forget. We want to forget. And, and one of the methods, and I'm saying to you, this is a method that the world has had over thousands of years, this method, and you've imbibed it. You now use it as a method. It's a method of avoiding a relationship with God by projecting all this crap at God and not at the very people who cause those particular feelings. That's how you've avoided it. You follow? And you really need to grasp that, even if you can just intellectually grasp how serious that is. Because, because at the end of the day, we said in a previous discussion, we said the only way to get an education in love is to connect with a source that's higher than yourself. And if that source is God, if God exists, that source is God. And if God does exist and the source is God, and you've got all these feelings about God that are actually not about God at all, so you don't even have to process them about God because they're not about God. But if you want to keep believing that you have these feelings about God when they're not about God at all, then you're not going to get anywhere with God. And the reason why you're doing it is because you want to get somewhere with your family of origin. You want to still have a relationship with them. You still want to feel that everything was all right from your childhood. It wasn't that bad. It wasn't as bad as what God thinks it was. So, so this is what you do. You blame God for a whole heap of things God did not do so that you can avoid blaming the actual people who did it and feeling through the process of the hurt of that. It's a way of distancing yourself emotionally from the actual hurt you, you're in. It's very simple. To stop that is very simple. All you need to do is to see that this is the truth about God that's inside of you. This is the truth about family of origin inside of you, whether it be towards dad or mum or both. That's or school teachers and so forth, right? Older brothers and sisters who looked after you, whatever. That's how you see it, saw that. And what I'm suggesting to you is if you could change that one thing, which you can do with your will, it's a choice you're making. You can change that. And if you change that, you will no longer join these feelings with God and you'll start to see that God is just like a blank slate to you. You don't know anything. And, it, and what I like about that is that that means then you're open to discovery. All right? Whereas at this stage, while you think this, you're not open to discovery. Uh, in fact, if anything, you'd like to reject discovery. You don't want to know that person further, do you? I find it interesting. We, we, think, we think we want to not know that person further, but yet most of us are still addicted to trying to understand our parents rather than just coming to the conclusion in the end that actually our parents knew nothing about love like, just like we did and as a result of that they treated us in this very unloving manner with all these different things that confused the hell out of us and taught us that love is something that it's completely not but we now believe that to be true. We, we, we don't want to face that. We'd rather blame all that on God than face it. So this is a big problem we have. Jennifer? <coughs> <coughs> I realise that I've been brainwashed by my family of origin but the family of origin has also brainwashed me about God so I became very confused about God I don't but think you're confused about God I think their brainwashing about God has been very specific and, and I don't think there's much confusion I feel that the reality is the only, the only time you feel confused is when you talk to me about God okay. <laughs> because so I'm presenting a different how, I don't know how to think or feel about God 
No, I think you do know how to think and feel about God. You just need to, you, it's these things you actually think and feel about God. Yeah. But, but you need to see that you're joining it with God when really it's not about God, it's about someone else. Yeah, I, do, I just remembered a remark my dad said when I told him about you and he said, well, don't go pushing that onto me. And I think that shut me down for a long time because I was scared I was going to um, lose that which was my father. So, yeah, and in the end of the yeah. day, I'd be so happy to lose that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be yeah. happy. Yeah. But yeah. You can, see, can you see how much stuff we have with our families? We're so desperate for family, the concept of family, that we think having at least that is better than having nothing. How ludicrous is such a belief? Mm. Isn't it better to have nothing than to have that? I would much rather have not a friend in the world than have all my friends like that. Wouldn't you? Well, no, the majority of you don't think that way. The reality is the majority of a lot of your friends are like that to you and you think it's better. Right? This is what has to change. I, I like the idea of the, the clean slate with God. Yeah, it'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? Yeah, um, I feel like I could just say to him now, Okay, let's start anew. And see what you really like. About you, and I want to know about you. Yeah. I want to know who you are. Yeah. yeah. Can you see it would probably open your heart more, wouldn't it? Now, when you came last night, the feeling I felt from the majority of you were very closed hearts, very afraid, very closed in your heart. And these are the reasons why. Because, it, because you have all these beliefs about God and love that cause your heart to be closed and you're unwilling to process through it emotionally because it means actually processing through how you were actually treated by the people who actually harmed you rather than creating a figment of your own imagination and putting it all on God. And that's why your hearts are not open to God. Now, of course, if your hearts are not open to God, you're not going to listen to what God's messenger has to say to you, are you? Because all he's going to do is tell you all these wonderful things about God that you don't believe. And that you've not had a personal experience of. But not only that, you believe God to be almost in completely the opposite of what I'm trying to say God is. And now that, well, that is obviously going to have an effect if you're going to get educated in love. And this is why after many years, many of you have no, not shifted with regard to your viewpoint of love. Because you're rejecting the education from the source of love because of these problems. Very simple problem. It's a very simple problem, but, but the emotions with our family are so complicated that we're willing to blame someone else for them rather than address them. All right. And this is our big problem. Now, I've gone 10 minutes over, so we'll have a 10-minute break, but I'll shorten the next one by 10 minutes, the Q&A on this subject. So 10-minute break now, and we'll have a Q&A straight after. Thanks, guys. <laughs>